Hi and welcome to our October ACNC webinar. Today we're going to take some time to examine the important topic of charity fundraising. We're going to offer some guidance to those charities looking to ensure their fundraising meets good practice and provide some other tips towards fundraising effectiveness. My name's Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. With me is my colleague Matt Crichton. Hi Matt. Hello, hello everyone. Now as always, before we get into things, some preliminaries. If you have any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. You can call the number listed in the email you will have received when you signed up. And from there, you can put in an access code and listen to the webinar that way. You can also ask a question at any time through the webinar by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. We have our colleague Heath ready and waiting to respond to any questions that might come through. As we go along today, we'll try to answer the, all the questions that do come through, but and as always, it depends on the quantity, we may not be able to get to every single one. If your question isn't answered, please feel free to send us an email at education at acnc.gov.au and we'll get back to you with a response. We will allow time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you wanted to watch the presentation and save your questions till the end, that's okay as well. Also, we're recording this webinar too. So the recording, as well as the uh, presentation slides, they'll be published on the ACNC webinar in the coming days. That way you don't have to write down all the web website references because we're going to send a follow-up email with a list of the useful links and the other resources to all of you in the next day or two. And finally, we do value your feedback. If you have any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, please let us know in the short survey at the end of the webinar or send us an email to the education address with some of your comments. Okie dokes. Where are we going to go today? We're going to look at five, well, relatively key areas of fundraising good practice. First up, we'll look at the importance of your charity having a clear and functioning fundraising strategy, as well as a solid fundraising policy. And yes, these are two different things. So we'll go through the distinctions of each of them. We'll look at the regulations and regulators in place for fundraising in Australia. There are a few from regulations covering fundraising licenses across states and territories to things like DGR requirements. And with online fundraising, crowdfunding and that sort of stuff now the norm, these laws become especially relevant. Some charities engage fundraising agencies or other third parties to carry out fundraising. Again, there are a number of responsibilities your charity has towards fundraising good practice. If doing so, we'll look at those as well. Your charity is likely to work with others when fundraising, even if it isn't a third party fundraiser. You might end up in a partnership with a corporate or a local business. You might end up on a crowdfunding website, or you even might stage a joint webinar, a joint webinar, joint fundraiser with another charity. You'll need to do the right thing when you do so. So we'll have a look at how you can work with others. Finally, any interactions with actual or prospective donors need to be conducted with respect. This is not only good practice, but it's just basic common sense. We'll delve into this as well later in the webinar. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I've got some uh, five quick questions here, as you can see on your screen, that people involved in charities should be asking themselves um, when they think about their fundraising strategy. Um, they are based on the key points that we're going to cover during the webinar. So they should be, um, a charity's responsible person should ask um, for their charity's fundraising strategy and their, their fundraising policy before they think about a fundraising um, event, campaign or whatever it may be. The people involved in a charity should be familiar with the laws and any particular requirements that their fundraising activities have. Um, and this is especially important if they are overseeing fundraising or, or decisions for fundraising for the charity. So if it's the, maybe the members of the board or, or the committee. Um, they should ask about the guidelines that the charity has um, for working with others. Again, what, what does the charity uh, set as its rules and guidelines for, for um, engaging with um, other parties to conduct fundraising activities. And finally, the charity really does need to ask itself how it ensures that it will treat donors with respect and especially the um, vulnerable people that it may come across when it is conducting fundraising. And this last one is one that 
often um, gets forgotten in amongst all the planning and the strategizing and um, the goal setting of how much money an organization wants to raise. It's, it's um, easy to sort of fall off the edge of that discussion, but it is really an important one and it should be right at the forefront of responsible persons' minds when they are just thinking about setting up a fundraising campaign for a charity. How are you going to deal with um, donors and how are you going to deal with donors or potential donors that are um, considered vulnerable? Now, before we jump into those five or six uh, topics, just as a little bit of an intro to, uh, to the topic, we want to emphasise where the ACNC sits when it comes to uh, when it comes to fundraising. Um, first up, it's it's probably important to know that the ACNC does not have the responsibility for regulating fundraising. It's not our job. We we don't have that that role. Generally speaking, it's the states and the territories that that have the regulatory responsibility in fundraising. States and territories are where you seek out. For example, any any fundraising licenses you might you might need. Charities might also need to provide a report on any funds that they do raise to state or territory government uh, regulator or regulators. In some states or territories, there are special ar uh, arrangements that apply to charities that uh, that I guess do fundraising through through gaming. Uh, and when we say gaming, I guess gaming activities like like raffles, bingo, that sort of thing. Um, now the other regulatory sort of body here is the ATO. Uh, the ATO makes decisions on whether a charity is a deductible gift recipient. Um, and if you are a deductible gift recipient, you can offer tax deductions on money donated. DGRs, as they're called, have to meet certain requirements as set out by the ATO. Now our list of regulators that may affect charities, we've got a good list on our shiny new website. It's uh, at acnc.gov.au forward slash regulator list. Um, we've got uh, a great set of resources covering uh, fundraising regulators and regulations in each state and territory. They can also be found on our website at forward slash charity fundraising. Now, if the ACNC isn't responsible for charity fundraising regulation, what is our interest in the topic? It's pretty simple. The ACNC will have an interest in any behaviour which could see a charity not meet its obligations to us. For example, not reporting as it needs to, not providing information we, we require, or not meeting our uh, ACNC governance standards. In particular, Governance Standard 5 requires responsible persons to act with reasonable care and diligence, to act in the best interests of the charity and for its charitable purposes, and to ensure that the financial affairs of the charity are managed responsibly. Fundraising practices are an important part of a charity's operations, and the ACNC expects that it is properly overseen by the charity's responsible persons. An improper fundraising behaviour, behaviour that might breach governance standards, for example, that's the sort of thing that the ACNC may look into. Okay, so some fundraising issues that may um, <clears throat> spark the ACNC to, to look into the conduct of a charity. Um, Maybe that the a failure to, to protect the funds received or, or account for all the funds received during fundraising. It may be that there is um, weak governance and weak oversight of the charity's activities or resources. Um, possibly commercial participation or fundraising arrangements with professional bodies, professional fundraisers that is, that um, do not comply with the law and, and um, maybe are not in the charity's best interests or at least the decision to use those fundraisers is not um, in the charity's best interest. Um, fundraising activities uh, that may damage public trust and confidence, um, excessively high fundraising costs, um, maybe something that could act as, as a flag for the ACNC, uh, serious risks to a charity's reputation or assets, and um, Methods of fundraising which, which could possibly be a breach of the ACNC's governance standards. Also, maybe where there's conflicts of interest and private benefit that haven't been properly controlled or, or disclosed. And uh, serious or, or frequent failures in the conduct of fundraising. So maybe unlicensed fundraising, for example, which may put charity funds at risk. 
And of course, there is the potential for, for criminal behaviour related to fundraising, whether that be fraud, theft, tax fraud, that sort of thing, um, could, could possibly act as a flag too. But it's important to say that um, these are indications of, of the potentials and, and the ACNC would um, take each case on its merits within the, the context of the organisation's activities before it would des decide to or how it would um, use whatever regulatory powers it had in the area of fundraising. There is lots of um, information on our website about this area, particularly um, at acnc.gov.au forward slash fundraising FAQs. But again, we'll have that link in the follow-up email that goes out after, after this webinar. So um, a charity's proper conduct in fundraising is is important. Um, when we say proper conduct, we I, I suppose we're we're talking about maybe a nebulous term, but we're talking about um, acting with respect um, towards donors and potential donors and, and just the public in general, and following its its own policies and, and guidelines in in conducting fundraising and following the law, of course. And proper conduct is dictated by I suppose various common sense approaches and attitudes to fundraising and um, ensuring that the charity adheres to, to good practice. So basic things like being transparent with fundraising, both the approaches that the charity takes and approaches uh, to people. So it's approaches to campaigns and it's approaches to people in that it's how it deals with people face to face. And um, being responsible for all those actions at an exercising adequate oversight. So if you're in a role as a responsible person on a charity, it is it is really important to remember that it is your responsibility to um, have some oversight over the charity's fundraising activities and to ensure that the charity is really going about it the right way. And there are a bunch of ways you can go about this and we'll go through some of those now. First up, um, this fundraising strategy. We, we mentioned at the start of the webinar um, that a strategy differs from a policy. Perhaps the best way to illustrate the difference is to look at what each of them should contain. So first up, a fundraising strategy, it says more goal orientated. Um, it should, uh, I guess, look at things or include things like uh, an overall statement that covers the aims and the importance of your charity fundraising. Um, maybe a bit of an outline of some of the methods uh, of fundraising your charity uh, will pursue. That might be grants, uh, donations, uh, sales of items, things like you know, crowdfunding, corporate partnerships, um, even you know, a membership-based program. Um, should look at uh, or, or include the appointment of a, a coordinator, a fundraising coordinator, or someone who actually is responsible for overseeing and, and monitoring um, those fundraising efforts. Um, another thing that could be included is, I guess, the development of a plan or a strategy of fundraising activities. Um, which activities will be staged at what times? Uh, who's responsible for each activity? Um, things like key dates, timelines, uh, the planning involved permits, licenses, those those practical nitty gritty type things that you need to have covered. Uh, a strategy could also look at spelling out, I guess, the integrated approach to your charity, the, as, as suggested, the strategic approach your charity will take to fundraising. Short, uh, medium, long-term goals, uh, maybe some different approaches, whether a fundraiser is a, a fundraising event is, is a, a primary, sort of very important headline uh, fundraiser or money maker, or it's designed to be one that maybe bubbles along in the background and brings in a, a you know, a reliable, constant sort of stream of, of income. Um, maybe there's times where a fundraiser might be a, a big event uh, as well. So th those are the sorts of things that a strategy can spell out. Um, now, the Our Community, website through the through its funding centre. Uh, it has a, a pretty useful strategy that can be used by charities as a basis. The address, there you go, there's the link down the bottom of the page there. Um, go have a look, well worth a look, and uh, maybe adapt it for your own use. Now, as we mentioned, a policy is um, a little bit different to a strategy. If you think about the strategy as the sort of tactics, the, 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 the plans you have and for how you're going to get the money 
that you need and what events, what activities, that sort of thing. The policy can be viewed as, I suppose, the, the rules that your charity has that, that sort of underpin what the strategy is going to be. So the policy should um, have some legal considerations. That may be the fundraising licenses that you need, permits that you might need in certain areas. It should cover the responsibility for approving fundraising activities. So this is likely to fall to what the ACNC calls the responsible persons of a charity, which you might think of as the, the directors or the board or the committee. Um, that might be passed on to a fundraising coordinator, as Chris mentioned in the, with the previous slide. And it could, the policy should cover the the um, policies and statements on the types of fundraisers and fundraising methods and, and, and partners that the, the charity um, may use and may be prohibited from using. So there might be some some particular uh, professional fundraising bodies or, or particular methods that the, the, the charity has decided run contrary to its own values. And, and in the policy, it stated that the charity will not use these sorts of activities, these methods or these types of fundraisers in any of their activities or their strategies. And also a policy should have procedures on, on the money handling and, and reporting of the success or even failures, I suppose, of, of any fundraising campaigns and how it, how the charity that is, will, will manage the, um, the information and data that it receives of donors. Um, this is, again, probably another thing that sometimes falls off the edge of the considerations when um, setting up a fundraising campaign or a strategy is that the responsibility to manage people's information and data responsibly and um, in accordance with um, the law. So if you are collecting people's private information, the policy should um, underpin the rules um, by which you do so. Now, this, this policy that you set up, it, it can be referred to the charity as and as the sort of source of truth. It can also show um, the ACNC and, and for that matter, any, any other prospective partners or donors that the charity is responsible, it's committed to good practice and um, it adheres to the ACNC's governance standards. So in that sense, not only is it a, a useful document to underpin or set up the rules by which you do your fundraising, it can be used as a way to demonstrate that your charity is well run, well governed and, and transparent and responsible. And this sort of thing should be up for discussion and debate at your regular meetings, whether it be your annual general meeting in a bigger sense or, or just the, the regular smaller meetings, elements of the policy and for that matter the strategy can come up and be discussed at any time. So th think of it of course as an important document that sets up the rules but it's not um, set in stone and it, and it can be adapted and changed according to changing conditions. And having that ability to discuss um, these types of things at a regular meeting, to have it as a standing item on the agenda, gets everything out in the open. It allows responsible persons to have a chat. And, and if there is someone who's responsible for the fundraising, they can come in, they can offer their insights, they might have to give a report do some homework and that sort of stuff, but it, it keeps things literally on the agenda uh, and allows them to be discussed. Now, we've already touched on regulations and, and regulators, um, but again, we'll, we'll emphasise this. Um, states and territories are predominantly the bodies with oversight on fundraising. Now, this can cause challenges for, for charities, simply because fundraising laws differ across different jurisdictions. What might be regulated by laws in one state or territory may not be regulated uh, in another. Uh, and the way certain activities are regulated in, in one part of Australia might be different from how they're regulated in another part of Australia. If you fundraise on a national level or in a way that might attract donations from a number of places, and, and look, that's increasingly common. Um, the internet, obviously, online fundraising, um, online donation platforms, crowdfunding, uh, all of those sorts of things, even the use of social media. Um, 
If you're doing that, it's vital to remember a couple of points. A charity that wants to conduct fundraising at a national level may need to be registered to fundraise in each state and territory. And a charity may be in breach of fundraising laws and regulations if it accepts funds from someone living in a state or territory where the charity is not registered to fundraise. Now, again, charity board members, responsible persons, uh, they must be aware of these laws um, and, and the law, these laws and, and how they govern um, fundraising activities, including uh, stuff that's online. Being aware of the legal requirements and ramifications of conducting fundraising campaigns is part of running a well-governed charity and it should be an important part of a charity's planning. Yes, it should. And it should be noted that, again, I know we said this at the beginning, but it's worth reiterating that the ACNC doesn't administer any laws over fundraising and specifically the types of things that Chris just mentioned. So when we say the responsible persons, the board members or the directors should be aware of the laws that govern fundraising activities, maybe the first step is to figure out where these laws sit, who's responsible, when yeah. I say who, yeah. which which um, sort of agency, government agency that is, is responsible. And then you can set about um, you know, finding the specifics of where your activities fit in to those laws. So um, as we mentioned before, the regulator list on our website has a, has a good list of them. But in, generally speaking, um, fundraising laws in Australia sit at the state and territory level and each state and territory will have its own agency responsible for fundraising laws. And they're often um, either Consumer Affairs, for example, Consumer Affairs Victoria, or Fair Trading um, is, is another common name by which they go. Yep. Okay, now outsourcing fundraising um, and using third-party fundraisers, some people might call them professional fundraisers, is, is increasingly common too. And... Um, Let's just say at the outset that there's nothing inherently wrong with with doing this. Um, it, it's a common practice, and in many cases, charities uh, simply don't have the the resources, the time, even the expertise to be able to run a uh, an effective fundraising campaign. So the use of people that that do have the the, the time, the resources, and the expertise can often really be beneficial for a charity and bring in more money than they would have been able to do on their own. But of course, um, that this comes with some, some caveats and, and, and some potential pitfalls. Um, so sometimes it, it might simply be more efficient or cost effective for a charity, even a large charity, to work with an agency. And um, th this might involve things like street collections or door-to-door -door, um, fundraising activities. Mm. Um, and But while charities may do this and, and may have success with this, it's important to realise that they are not allowed to outsource their responsibilities. So as we've got on the screen there, that, that little, I suppose, uh, catchphrase is something that people <laughs> involved in charities should bear in mind, that while you can outsource your fundraising, the activities, that the labour and the manual work involved, you cannot outsource your responsibilities. So even if you do engage a third party fundraiser, a professional fundraising body to do some um, fundraising work on your behalf, whatever they do is in the name of your charity and being the directors or the board members of the committee of that charity, it is your responsibility. It has effectively, I suppose, down the uh, the command line, the yes. decision line, it, yeah. the, it, the, the buck stops with the board of directors that the committee members on the charity for having made the decision to engage this third party fundraiser to conduct activities on their behalf so there's no washing your hands of whatever um, negativity may come with using such professional bodies to help you with fundraising so if, it's important to bear in mind that if um if your charity decides to work with a fundraising agency it, in choosing the agency, it must be diligent. It, it's got to consider the, um, the practices, even the policies of the prospective fundraising company, agency or body, and and really think carefully about whether or not it is um, appropriate for your charity and whether or not the arrangement um, 
allows the people on the charity to have sufficient oversight of the activities that are conducted in its name. It might seem um, like a, a good idea to, to hand this off to a fundraising agency or company and then sort of not hear about it until you get the windfall of all these millions of dollars coming in. But the charity really does need to have oversight of the specifics of the activities that are going on because it's done in their name and it's their responsibility. And a responsible charity will want to know how things are going along anyway if it's through progress reports, you know, yep. even pick up the phone and, and ask a couple of silly questions and make sure that you are being diligent and make sure you, are, you do have oversight. Yep. Now, what have we got here? There's some quick tips on um, on using a fundraising agency. Um, now, we'll go down to the bottom of that slide before we go back up to the top again. We do have guidance on, on um, working with fundraising agencies, at, again, at that link down the bottom of the screen there. Um, now, some of the considerations that, that uh, Matt was just talking about, they, they go beyond just, I guess, how much it might cost to, to work with or to let's say employ, engage a, uh, a third party fundraiser. Um, although it might be tempting for a charity to look at a fundraising agency and select one based solely on cost, um, particularly if, you know, for example, it's fundraising needs are a little bit urgent, there are a number of factors that go beyond cost which charities should examine. Uh, now, some of them are up on the screen. Uh, they include um, the, the agency or the fundraiser's values how, and how they align to the charities, uh, how transparent it is, um, its reputation, its, its financial situation. It's no use engaging a fundraiser if they themselves are not travelling very well. Um, its experience, its areas of expertise, um, maybe some past performance, some past uh, successes it's, it's had. Um, its structure and, and how it uses uh, subcontractors. Um, charities should have a thorough understanding of the operations of any fundraising agency they consider uh, working with. Um, these also include things like an agency's employment policies and practices, how it trains, treats and supports staff, how it works with staff, how it handles and deals with complaints, uh, its financial management, its stability, uh, how it handles and protects people's data in turn, uh, all of those sorts of things. Uh, a, a charity must conduct adequate due diligence before entering an agreement to work with a fundraising agency. But before entering a fundraiser, things don't stop there. You've got to continue to monitor activities as they occur. Ultimately, a charity should be satisfied that the fundraising agency it is considering is aware of its legal obligations has appropriate policies and processes to ensure compliance and shares the values of the charity. Now, we've taken a bit of time on this topic because of its importance and we've had issues in the past, there've been issues in the past where um, third party fundraisers uh, have hit uh, the headlines, uh, a small portion of them, for the wrong reasons. So you need to remember, and we emphasise again, you can outsource your fundraising, but you cannot outsource your responsibilities. And choosing the wrong third party to work with impacts on a charity's standing and reputation. Now, we're looking at partnerships and, and, and things like that now. And we, I guess the most common form for a long time uh, of, of partnership has been uh, sponsorships. Um, they've been part of the fundraising landscape for, for ages. Uh, often these arrangements have seen charities and businesses from the same area, maybe the same suburb or town, uh, partner in an arrangement that delivers benefits for both parties. But an increasing number of organisations working in a, in a more structured and a more strategic way with other organisations through what are known as corporate partnerships. Corporate partnerships go beyond just being a sponsorship. In fact, things like sponsorships and the provision of extra funding can be viewed as maybe basic, simple forms of corporate partnerships. Corporate partnerships are arrangements where charities or community organisations work with corporate or business uh, interests to deliver on an arrangement that is mutually beneficial. Partnerships like these see a charity maybe receive a benefit. It might be sponsorship, as we've mentioned, volunteers, 
um, goods, services, resources, expertise, uh, pro bono or in-kind support, all of those sorts of things. In return, they offer a benefit to the corporate partner. Now that's important. Uh, that might be the promotion of the partner's business through you know, even signage or things like that. Naming rights to an event, um, sponsorship opportunities, preferred supplier status, uh, participation at charity events, um, and of course there'd be reputational benefits perhaps on offer as well. This arrangement should also see a not noticeable benefit to the community as a whole. So not just to the charity, not just to the business, but the community needs to benefit too. Again, we have a, a great guide on charities and corporate partnerships. Uh, the link is there up on the screen. That's at uh, forward slash uh, partnerships. But again, there are some keys when it comes to raising funds uh, through these partnerships or not just raising funds, producing other benefits as well. Uh, one of the most important ones we've already touched on, that is to do your due diligence and carefully consider who you're working with and the details of any arrangement you have when working with them. You need to ask yourself, um, responsible persons at a charity need to ask themselves, is the business a good fit with your organisation? Do its values and aims align with your charities? Or at least do they not exist in conflict with the values and aims of your charity? Uh, are there any risks, for example, there might be financial, uh, operational or even reputational, that might arise in working in a partnership? And if so, how will your charity address them? Um, are there any no-go zones or businesses you will not work with in a partnership arrangement? Um, one obvious one might be, say, a, a junior sporting group or, a, or something like that. Uh, perhaps shying away from working in partnership with a business that, that sells alcohol or a business that maybe promotes gambling. Um, that might be a consideration that your organisation needs to discuss and needs to discuss at an early stage well before engaging in a, in a partnership. Um, the key to this situation is to be aware of the possibilities and the benefits of partnerships, but also to be aware of the amount of work required, because there is a lot of work required and it's, it's ongoing work, um, and also the risks that might be involved. Don't put your charity at risk just to raise a quick buck. And, and look, that's true of everything that we've already said in this webinar and pretty much everything that we'll cover from here on in too. Um, so again, uh, refer to that guidance that we've got at forward slash partnerships. It's well worth a read and, uh, and well worth a look. Um, crowdfunding and online fundraising has become increasingly popular and of course, why wouldn't it? Everyone's got the technology and it's a pretty easy thing to do, especially with these websites that are set up effectively to do all the work for you. You sort of sign in and start a campaign and off you go, the money rolls in. I mean, it's again, it's again something that a charity should consider carefully before they decide to um, use as a as a fundraising uh, income source. Um, number one, people involved in charities should be aware of the laws that come with um, crowdfunding and online fundraisers, and and make sure that whatever their activities are comply with various state and territory fundraising regulations. And again, we wouldn't expect you to know these off the top of your head, so it's, it's worth um, taking the time to just, just investigate a little bit. If you're a charity that operates nationally, it may be that you have to think about how these or what different laws apply in different states and territories. If, if you operate just in a single state, it might be a little bit less homework, but nonetheless, the homework is important, is an important step and it's worth doing. Um, have think about, there, there are many different sites that do this, uh, so it's worth having a look at the different features and the different um, obligations that sites impose upon organisations that use them. So check to see if the site is charging you anything for the service. Um, if it is, uh, make sure that you're satisfied that the charges aren't excessive, that there's something that the charity can uh, manage and, and importantly justify if anyone was to ask questions. Um, also online donation sites may take a small percentage of the do donations uh, that a charity receives. So um, the charity, people involved in the charity should know about these charges. You don't want to be surprised at the end when you think you've got lots of money. It turns out that you've had to give over some of it to the to the website. Um, make sure that you're aware of the deal um, and that you're, you're happy with the conditions upon which your use of the site um, is based. And um, maybe even communicate to donors that the arrangement 
does come with um, a fee or a percentage taken by by the website just as a, a a show of transparency and good faith that that you you're aware of it you're passing the information on to the donor but it's part of the tr part of the transaction and and it's something that you've decided to to go with so make sure even when you're using the online crowdfunding sources make sure you've done your homework you know where the law sits in the particular jurisdictions and um, you know what obligations are placed upon your organization for using it and how much fees you're going to be paying for using it as well um, just try not to allow your charity to incur excessive fees particularly unknown fees and charges when using these services we have a guide on this on our website too, which goes into it in a bit more detail for acnc.gov.au forward slash crowdfunding. Again, this link will be in the follow-up email. Now, the theme of um, treating treating them, treating donors with respect uh, is one that should carry through all your uh, interactions with, with donors and, and with supporters, um, both, both actual donors and supporters and prospective donors and supporters. Um, the charity's fundraising practices should be consistent with the values of the organisation. I mean, we cannot uh, underestimate the, the, uh, that uh, it's probably worth dwelling on that and, and thinking about that. Um, charity should always treat donors and potential donors fairly and respectfully. Um, there are all manner of things your charity should do as part of this attitude uh, of, of respect. There's a, there's a few that will that we'll work through and we'll we'll run through here. Um, obviously, I guess the first is to ensure that any approaches that you that you make uh, to donors, uh, to members of the public, um, now those approaches can be in person, they can be online, they can be in writing. Uh, though they should be respectful and honest. Um, you should be informative as well. Tell people why you, why you're fundraising and and tell them what their donations will go towards. Uh, how it will make a difference. This is this sort of storytelling is good. Um, it's it's good practice to inform people of where their hard earned is going, and then to inform them again through a follow up communication and follow up email or or, or even a note, uh, something as simple as that, um, through the web th website, through uh, your annual report. Um, stay in touch with people who support you. Uh, it's not only good practice, it's good good manners as well, I suppose. Um, being respectful means that you don't go out hassling people when you're asking for donations. Don't pursue people down the street. Don't shout at them. Don't deluge them with communications, especially after they've told you they don't wish to donate or if they've told you that they can't donate right now. That's respectful. This is not only good fundraising practice. Again, it's just good manners. It puts your charity in a good light. Act responsibly when your fundraising activities see you engaging with people in vulnerable circumstances as well. Now we've mentioned uh, we've mentioned uh, people in vulnerable circumstances before. Uh, we have a guide again, um, and there's the link down the bottom: acnc.gov.au/vulnerablepeople. Um, people who are in vulnerable circumstances are those who might not be, or who are not, sorry, in a position to make a, a confident and informed choice about donating to a charity. Now, that might mean that you know, some people may not have the, the capacity to make that, that type of decision. Some may be in a vulnerable position. Um, others might need a little bit of extra support or a little bit of care. Um, the extent um, of, a, of a person's capacity to make a decision about donating is reduced, uh, and if it is, it, it might depend on their particular circumstances. Uh, some people in vulnerable circumstances may still be uh, able to make an informed decision if they have the extra care and support that they need. So having the capacity to make a decision to donate to charity means that a person is able to, either alone or with support, uh, fully understand the information that, that your charity will present to them. Um, to properly consider the information and the consequences of any decision to donate, and then to be able to communicate their decision clearly. Uh, they're, they're the keys. And just to finish up on this topic, treating donors with respect also does touch on um, the issue of efficient fundraising. So, of course, your charity can spend 
money to raise more funds. We've touched on this when we were um, talking about uh, using fundraising agencies and other uh, professional fundraising companies. So, so it's fair, it's legitimate for a charity to spend money to, to make some more money. Um, as long as this is in line with the charitable purpose and the costs that they incur in doing so should should be reasonable. And the decisions about how a charity will raise funds are made by the charity's governing body, that's the responsible persons as we often refer to them. Um, you probably know them as the board or the committee. So this means that the responsible persons really do need to do the right thing and um, make sure that uh, just this, this entire notion of treating donors with respect is central to whatever decisions they make on fundraising. And just a final point, again, we mentioned it at the beginning, but protecting people's information and data. So um, inevitably when, when you um, get donations from people, I suppose unless it's dropping a couple of coins in a tin, you're likely to get someone's name, their, their phone number, contact details, email address, that sort of thing, and even bank details in some um, instances. Um, make sure that your organisation has thought this through and has uh, clear um, policies and practices for how they're going to manage the people's information and data. Um, and of course, beyond the legal uh, requirements of managing information and data, there are community expectations about how a charity will, will do so. So if someone's deciding to donate to your charity, it's unlikely that they are also giving you permission to pass the email address on to a whole bunch of other people to then be asked for, for donations to. So that's yes. the sort of thing we're talking about when we say community expectations and being aware that uh, people making donations uh, are doing so with the clear intent to, to donate to your organisation. It, it's a separate thing from assuming that they'll be a likely target for other donations <laughs> and that their email address is is, is a, something worth passing on. Yeah. All of this is vital to a charity's reputation and of course a charity's success and sustainability rests heavily on its reputation. So um, don't take this aspect of it lightly because if you do, the, the negative ramifications of of it will likely come back to, to hurt the charity later on. Okay, um, we do have a uh, the guide at the bottom there, acnc.gov.au forward slash information and data is a page that you can have a look at that goes into this in a bit more detail, including some of the legal uh, requirements of, of managing people's information and data. Now just to finish up today's webinar, we're going to go run through a few, or the main points to, to take away from it. And we have six to go through. Um, the first couple, uh, have a fundraising policy and strategy for your charity. So these are important documents that all charities really should have in place and that the people responsible for governing a charity, the board, the committee, they, they should all be familiar with these. And the second point on this uh, screen at the moment is that charities do have a number of regulators and regulations that they may need to comply with for fundraising so it's important just to know which ones your charity um know which laws your charity has to comply with and which regulators are involved um a little bit linked to that point that matt just made uh it's worth remembering that while the acnc doesn't have direct oversight of fundraising uh, we do take an interest if a charity's fundraising uh, related behaviour sees it at risk of breaching governance standards. Um, so that's point three. Point four, again, your charity, your responsibilities. Um, you can outsource some of your charity's fundraising activities, but you can't outsource your charity's responsibilities in doing so. And the last couple of points we made, um, play nice with others and ensure <laughs> that you do your due diligence when deciding to work with other agencies. Um, do a bit of homework, do a bit of research on each of them to make sure that they are the type of organisation your, your charity does want to work with. And of course, treat people with respect, treat donors with respect and prospective donors with respect and even the people that refuse or just yeah, or definitely rudely or politely or in whatever way, whatever manner they do, um, act properly, act uh, um, maturely, transparently, and, and respectfully, 
because um, all of this reflects upon your charity and, and its reputation. So this is the, sort of the end of our formal presentation today. We've had quite a number of questions though pop up throughout and we're still online so if you've got a, any questions that you would like to ask now if we get a chance to answer them we will. Um, but we've had a few come through that we thought we'd share with everyone because they've 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 got enough um, I suppose broader appeal that uh, we thought a lot of people might get something out of these answers. So one question we did have was about uh, the use of product based fundraisers, so chocolates and the like, um, appropriate fundraising. So are, are there any rules or guidelines for charities to follow? Um, with the products that are involved in their their fundraising? Um, I guess the first thing to consider, the first thing to figure out is that, that these types of activities, obviously fundraising activities, have to comply with the law. So um, that's each state and territory uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but this is more of a question of, I guess, appropriateness of... of certain fundraisers um, and for the most part it's something that that individual charities are going to have to I guess uh, look at and address to their own satisfaction uh, and and this is where uh, your your charity's fundraising policy which we discussed during the main part of this webinar uh, this is where it comes into play your policy should contain I guess these sorts of statements on on what methods, what products, what other things your charity will and won't do when it comes to fundraising. Um, and again, this sort of thing might be a, a good discussion point for your charity's responsible persons. Um, we mentioned activities in relation to, you know, say uh, alcohol, say, you know, gambling. Um, some, some fundraising, uh, some charities might even have an issue with using chocolate uh, as a, as a you know, or uh, other food products, uh, ones that might contain nuts, for example. Um, you know, uh, do we have an issue with those? Are they healthy? Is this something that we wish to do? Um, do we link ourselves, you know, through sponsorship to certain organisations or, or products or behaviours? Um, and then maybe it's worth having a bit of a think of when you're putting this policy together, what are your alternatives if you don't want to go on the you know, the old chocolate bar fundraiser, what alternatives do you have? There are alternatives out there. There are plenty of them. Um, so for many of these types of questions, you've you've got to, as a charity, it's it's something that you, you have to approach and discuss uh, regularly. And it's, it's different for each charity as well. Um, you might have an argument, you know, for or against each one. So it needs to be raised. You need to discuss it and you need to resolve it. Uh, and then you need to, you know, perhaps get some definitive statements down in your policy. Um, doing so obviously allows you to form this policy, but it also allows you to, uh, if someone asks you about your you know, fundraising habits, your fundraising activities, your charity will have a, a good old sort of explanation on hand uh, about, you know, what, why you're doing it, what you've discussed, and, and it will be something that's uh, come about after some some considered discussion as well. Um, now we did have another another question, um, and it was one that came up, one that we sort of our advice people sometimes get asked. We we often get asked too. There's um, if a charity's had well, we'll say a good year, uh, has 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 travelled well, has got a little bit of money, maybe sitting in the bank or something like that, some reserves and that sort of stuff. Is it still appropriate to fundraise? Uh, can a charity do this? Should a charity do this? Um, yeah, it, it, it's a tricky one. It, the short answer is yes. There's there's um, no sort of a, a I suppose limit that if you if you reach a certain amount of, of a target in one year, then you're you're temporarily suspended from <laughs> from fundraising. Beyond that, um, so th the short answer is yes, and it is fair uh, for a charity to continue to fundraise even if they've had a, a great campaign and raised a lot of a lot of money because we know that a charity, many charities, um, rely heavily on the donations that they receive and um, 
earning a bit of extra money in one fundraising campaign is a good thing that can um, see the charity's uh, sustainability through the next short term or even long term over the next few years. So um, yes, a, ch a charity can and and really should. Um, the one uh, connection to this question, I suppose, is um, the idea of banking money. Um, but when I say bank, I mean just putting it away, keeping it for a rainy day. Again, that's there's nothing inherently wrong with that, provided that um, the charity is doing so for uh, proper reasons and, and not not just hoarding money for the sake of for the sake of having money, but say putting putting aside some money as as a reserve for uh, protection against maybe future fundraising failures is a reasonable thing to do. Maybe they're saving up to. Um, uh, do a new program next year or the year after and and to see that program come to light they they need to um, save a bit of their money to make sure that it's 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 um, feasible in a couple of years time it might be that they need to, to purchase equipment if yeah. you're if you're a, I suppose a medical research charity um, what you're spending money on would be much different to an organization that uh, is doing or maybe something like a, a food bank or, yeah. or a soup kitchen. So, and the costs involved will be much more as well. So, it's it's not fair to um, uh, judge a charity's financial decisions um, in a one size fits all manner. Um, all charities' activity, well, charities are different. Their activities are different. The costs they incur are different, and their need for funds for whatever purposes. Um, will be different too. So um, as long as the um, as, lo as long as the the charity is still fundraising for uh, charitable purposes, using its funds for charitable purposes, that there's no reason why it can't continue to, to raise funds. And it might be that in some circumstances, it's, it's in the charity's interest to state explicitly why they're doing this particular campaign so yeah. that they they have plans to buy a particular thing whether it's a, a new office or they're releasing a new program or they're doing something new in a couple of years so that could be part of the promotional material or just just even the explanations of on a fundraising campaign saying we're undertaking this to be able to buy a new what you call it or yep. to to run a new program in 2020 so we need the funds for this and you can even use that as uh, i suppose um further persuasion techniques for your donors to yeah. try and get them to to jump on board and help you out with the particular thing that you're trying to do yeah got time for one more one more i think uh, we're getting close to midday oh sorry not midday. one o'clock <laughs> um okay all right, uh, we'll get on to the third-party fundraising things. It's been a, quite a popular topic today. So, if we, if a charity is using volunteers to help fundraise, um, how do we ensure? Oh, actually, this one's about volunteers, but I suppose it still applies yeah. to third-party fundraisers. Yeah. Um, if we're using volunteers to help fundraise, how do we ensure that they are doing the right thing? And um, what do we expect, or, or here to, or what do we see as best practice? Um, I guess when your if your charity is lucky enough to have some volunteers who are willing and able to get out and about and 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 do some fundraising, um, communication is 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 often the key. Uh, these people will probably be familiar with your charity, familiar with what it does. Um, so you, as a charity, to be able to communicate with them uh, and to be clear. Uh, with them is 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 key. If you're getting volunteers or helpers to help you out, you you should really take the time to, I guess, chat with them, communicate with them about what your charity wishes them to do or, or not to do uh, as well. Um, you shouldn't be afraid of preparing maybe some guidelines, um, a little bit of information, a little kit or a little pack, or you know even just a A4 sheet of paper just with a bit of a, a rundown. Um, and and to prepare it for those who are fundraising for you, this sort of thing can give you a, give them I guess a bit of information about maybe some answers to questions that members of the public or prospective donors might have. Um, 
it can also outline what your charity might see as, you know, acceptable behaviours, um, you know, do's and don'ts, um, that sort of thing. Um, even, I mean, if it's something where you're getting a number of volunteers out there, it might be a good idea to get them together uh, and to go through some of these things to have a bit of a briefing or, or an information session before they go out and, uh, and solicit some donations. They can ask some questions, you can provide some answers um, and there's, there's that thread of communication there. So that's the key, communication is the key. You, you really need to be clear about what expectations your charity has um, and you need to be clear about the information you, you want these volunteers to, uh, to convey. Don't leave them in the lurch, they're doing you a favour, they're helping you out. So again, treat them with respect, do the right thing by them. I think that's about that, that is about all that's about all time we yes. have today um i'll um ooh, we'll wind this one up now uh there's a number of ways you can stay in touch as as always you can see the many and varied ways that we've got for uh, people to interact with us get in touch with us and uh and that sort of thing so feel free to do so we will hang around for a touch longer a couple more minutes just in case there are any are uh, uh, any last minute questions? Um, again, if we don't get round to uh, your question, email us uh, at that education at acnc.gov.au address um, and we'll be able to help you out, provide a response to any queries that you might have. Now, the usual caveat before we go, we're always looking to improve what we do here at the ACNC. So, we would love it if you took the time to let us know what you thought of today's session. There's a very, very short survey just after things wrap up here. If you've got a couple of spare minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, and if you've got any extra comments, again, education at acnc.gov.au, that would be wonderful. Um, and if you want to uh, go to our website, check out where um, check out the new website. That's very exciting. Also check out the um, where our uh, next webinar is and, and what it's about. Uh, feel free to do so. Um, that's about it. Thank you to Heath, who has typed away madly answering a whole heap of questions. Um, thank you, Matt. Thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for everyone uh, for joining us, and we'll see you another time. See you later.